Hi, everyone. This is Margot Donahue of the Wood Creep Podcast, and my cohort in creepitude every episode is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friends. Yes, you are listening to the Queen's Podcast today, but Katie and Nathan got so many complaints about their salty language that they asked their fellow podcasters to announce at the top of the show they will be using filthy language here. It is F-bombs and S-words. But if you like swearing, have we got a show for you. The What a Creep podcast, we talk about creeps from the past to the present. But if swearing is your game, you definitely want to check us out at the What a Creep podcast. We talk about creeps of the past and the present. We end every episode with someone who's not a creep, so you don't think the whole world is a dumpster fire. All right, everyone. So here we go. Queen's podcast. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Queens, Queens. All day. I'm coming straight out to NYC. Queens, Queens. All day, all day, all day. <laughs> but now you know the truth like a polygraph. Bobby J. Too thorough representing. Nathan. Katie, we're back. We're back. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being patient while we were on a little break. How are you, Nathan? I, I'm great, and I am having a fabulous hair day. Your hair does <laughs> look really nice. I did not put a lick of product in it. You just, oh you just woke God. up like this? I just woke up like this. Well, I, I showered and looked like this. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm sorry, the song, uh, the song Mr. Vane from the 90s is Call playing. Call me Mr. Vane, Mr. Vane. Our younger <laughs> listeners will not know that song. No. Nope. I know what you're talking about. Brings me back to middle school dances. Absolutely. Those are the best. Well, Nathan, who are we talking about today? We are talking about Queen Lilioku Alani. Yes. We're going to call her Lily because (laughs) it's a beautiful name, but we don't want to fuck it up. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) She was the one and only queen of Hawaii and the last monarch of the Hawaiian kingdoms. She was a politically active ruler who focused on restoring the monarchy in her lands. And when the goal of the United States was to annex Hawaii. So she had a lot to fight against. Yeah. So first let's do a little bit of shout out. (laughs) First, we want to shout out our new Patreon supporters Thank you, and a big shout out to Denise and Catherine. And also a shout out to Deborah and Stacy. Yes, so thank you for being our Patreon supporters, but thank you for anybody that listens to our silly little show. We love y'all so much. Oh, and special shout out to Diana, who actually ended up guessing the clue right on our Facebook group of who we were going to do. I don't know if she got it from the Facebook group uh, hint or the hint that I dropped over on Patreon in the first ever booze clues. Yes. For a long time, people have been requesting that we do videos of Nathan making our cocktails and he started doing them over on the Patreon this week. So there's new content, bitches. (laughs) Diana figured out booze clues. Diana figured (laughs) out booze booze clues. clues. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of with which Nathan tell us about this cocktail what are we drinking so I didn't say the name of the cocktail in the video because you would have gotten it real quick um the (laughs) name of the cocktail is the aloha away so aloha sorry that's uh, so word to the wise uh queen lily actually wrote aloha away so Mm -hmm. that's why I did that so what's in it is three ounces of passion fruit juice one and a half ounce of pineapple juice, one ounce of a dark rum, one ounce of a SoCo, that's Southern Comfort if you're nasty, (laughs) Um, half ounce of orange carousel and two dashes of Angostura bitters. You can use whatever bitters you really want because it's just bitter. (laughs) Um, But you just shake it up and pour it in a glass. It's very um, tropical tasty smooth so be careful because there's actually a lot of fucking alcohol in it and it goes down really smooth so drink responsibly bitches that is always the problem with these fruity (laughs) drinks you're like this is so good and you don't realize it's got like seven different liquors in it (laughs) so fucking true (laughs) oh my goodness so let's dive in 
Queen Lily was born on September 2nd, 1838 in a big old grass hut, a big ass grass hut. <laughs> that makes her a Virgo, right? Yup. So in that big ass grass hut in the punch bowl center in Honolulu, baby Queen <laughs> Lily was born. Her parents were <clears throat> Analea Keohoka Lole and mm-hmm. Caesar Kappa Akea. Guys, we're probably going to fuck up a bunch of these names. We're going to give most of the people some nicknames. <laughs> yeah. So hold on to your bonnets, bitches. <laughs> so don't at us. We've You've been warned. <laughs> Queen Lily's birth name was Liliu Kamakuau. How was that? So uh, I read that what her name meant was smarting, as in like, ouch, that smarts. Mm-hmm. Not like, ooh, I'm very smarting. Yeah. I don't know. Um, tearful a burning pain and sore eyes so she literally got her name from the queen that was like currently reigning because she had pink eyes <laughs> so i love how oh you, you're like oh her name her name was so beautiful it's like it, she got her name it means pink, pink eye. eye that is an interesting choice all around yeah right but she did end up adopting the uh christian name lydia lily would have been a christian and raised a christian at this point in hawaii the native religion really wasn't acknowledged anymore and just really Mm -hmm. wasn't in play all that much um there had been a shitload of american and english missionaries and settlers that have popped up in Hawaii so that you know the Christian religion really had taken over pretty much yeah and it was uh Lily's like great great aunt I believe that was responsible for like officially making the religion of the islands to Christianity so I read in uh Lily's autobiography that there was like this huge fucking like bougie ass like meaningful Hawaiian ceremony where she like plucks these berries at the base of um you know Kilauea the volcano and she she, she like goes down into the crater of the volcano Ooh. as she's like sing, as she's singing like some Christian hymn. I'm, I'm thinking, wait in the lava, <laughs> wait in the lava I was, children. I was thinking, take <laughs> me to the river, drop me in the lava. <laughs> <laughs> so pick your poison. Yeah. Um, so after that, she threw the berries into the uh, lava to signify that she's breaking the power that the fire goddess Pele has over her people. Interesting. I thought that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. The Hawaiian islands then become the first like highly Americanized due to colonization um, with all the U.S. immigrants and British immigrants. Yeah, so there had at this point been a lot of white people coming Y'all. <laughs> so let's give a little bit of a background into Hawaiian society at this time leading up to, uh, or excuse me, leading up to right. this time. So here's where I'm going to really pronounce some shit wrong. Throughout Hawaiian history, there was a hierarchy of chiefs. So the first of which was called the Ali'i Nui, which was basically like your king. Yeah. And so below that you had like, these variety of other types of chiefs and this is where it like gets a little weird and incesty i know all royalty is kind of but particularly incesty yeah this is kind of close to egyptian incesty so you have the ali i naha which was a rank of chiefs that were uh products of half-blood siblings so it wouldn't be uncommon for like a dad to have two wives and another dad to have two wives and a wife to have two husbands and it that wasn't uncommon um and then beneath that you had the alihi wohi which were chiefs that you married uh that were close relatives like uh cousins maybe you know you might have the occasional like uncle niece marriage that's kind of weird you know, this is, this was a rabbit hole. I, yeah, I, I found this hardcore. whole caste system so interesting how they have like Me the too. main king and then like these minor chiefs who still mm-hmm. held a lot of power and how the main king would like delegate power to these more minor chiefs. Basically, so he could um, rule his people, but like delegate the dirty work down to these chiefs. Yeah, it, it was really interesting because it's so much different 
than um, like the European one system that we're mm-hmm. more familiar with. But what's funny is, is it, you can kind of see though how it became kind of like the European one once the British people came over and started influencing being like, okay, this name achieved, now you're basically a governor. Yeah. Now you're the mayor. So they just renamed those chiefs to kind of make it fit. Yeah. So it did work out. So what we're getting at is within Lily's line of uh, Lily's family tree, there's not a lot of branches. It's more like a wreath. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to describe it. Yes. <laughs> so before Lily's time, Hawaii had become westernized. And they replaced their old Hawaiian titles with traditional British monarchy titles. So now in the before time, they would have been a bunch of titles that we are going to have a hard time pronouncing. But by the time Lily hits the scene, they are called kings, queens, princesses, etc. Thank you (laughs) for being born later. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, but it's interesting. They adopted these titles but they didn't necessarily adopt the way that the British monarchy chose like their heir apparent or something like that. Yeah. So like, obviously in British and European, it's usually like the oldest son. Well, with Hawaiians, it would be like, I would hand it over to my sister or my brother first before I handed it over to my kid because my kid's only fucking 12 years old. (laughs) Outgoing monarch on their deathbed would be able to name an heir and it didn't necessarily have to be their kid. So I just thought that was really interesting. They're like, yes, we like these names. And then it was like, but we think how you do everything else is a little messy. So we're going to keep our own. (laughs) (laughs) So I also found interesting that whenever Lily was born, she was immediately sent off to live with uh, like adopted Mm. parents. So think of you know, ancient Rome, where you were immediately sent off to like an adopted parent's Mm -hmm. house. But it was like kind of expected as of a royal because it really kept these alliances really strong because bitch, that chief has your kid. (laughs) And if you step out of line, your kid's dead. (laughs) Again, we do see that a lot. I just think that's interesting. So many different societies, medieval Europe, it was called being the ward. Or, you know, being somebody's Mm -hmm. ward. And then, like you mentioned, in ancient Rome, you adopted a kid from a different family. And that adoption was just as binding as if they were, like, biologically your child, even though, like, maybe their parents Uh are still alive. So... Uh-huh. It was just, it's kind of interesting to see how so many of these societies follow the same thing, like follow the same traditions, just call them something different. Yeah, because Lily was closer to her foster parents than she was her real mm-hmm. parents. So it's kind of like an open adoption sort of situation yeah. where you know that this other person is biologically your parent, but the other one raised you and that you feel like they're more your parent. So like as a parent, you would end up raising two or three different kids that could all belong to different families. Right. So you've got like a bunch of different people's, it just like created this like intertwined noble community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of did branch out to the common folk eventually, but it was really like this tight knit noble community that, you know, you were raised by your dad's friend. Right. You know, so um, her her uh, adoptive parents were a great aunt and a great uncle, and their names were Kunia and Pack. So education time, because let's talk about her schooling, yes. because as we all know, educated women got to get shit done. When she was four, she was sent to a boarding school that was like exclusively for, you know, royal children of Hawaii, which was run by an Obviously, guy. like, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, sure. So it was called the Chief's Children's School at first, but they ended up uh, changing the name and made it the Royal School. Oh, how, how, how amazing. Yeah. As far as I can tell, there's no difference in the curriculum for the boys and the girls. I really Mm -hmm. liked that. I mean, I guess this is coming up on more modern time, but still for the 1800s, that wasn't always the case. So Mm -hmm. I liked they were like, yeah, y'all are all going to learn the same shit. Yeah. And it's basically the same sort of things that we would learn today. It's the same sort of like English, Mm -hmm. math, history, music, like so 
a lot of the same subjects, but Lily's favorite subject was always music every single yeah, time. Yeah, she was really talented. And she was, yeah, she was really good at it. That's what our drink n- named yes. after because she wrote the fucking song, bitch. And this will be important. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she spent most of her time at school, but then would go home to her adoptive parents on Sundays and on vacations. I thought it was really cool, like at the school, like both of her biological brothers and all her cousins were at that school. So she grew up really tight knit with her family and really um, finding those family connections really important to her. And I thought that was really cool because a lot of times we study these royal kids that just live like a really secluded childhood. And that wasn't the case for her. She was really tight with her family. Yeah, but she fucking hated school or at least the royal school uh, because she did say that like, I I remember reading in her autobiography, I couldn't learn anything because I was starving all the time. And I was like, I can kind of relate because I remember like whenever you're a kid and it's it's the class right before lunchtime and you're just like, ah, I can't concentrate. And then after you I mean, eat and you go back to class, you're like, oh, that's, that's okay. still me. <laughs> like, <laughs> Katie's just like that all the time. The people running the school maybe didn't treat the kids very kindly, which sucks. Yeah. So something that I read that like really kind of impacted uh, Lily was that like there was this really bad measles outbreak. I think she was like eight or nine at the mm-hmm. time, I believe. And uh, and it claimed like so many lives. Think like what happened when the American settlers, or the, excuse me, the English settlers brought smallpox yeah. over to the Indian people. Yeah. It devastated them. And so Lily lost like aunts, uncles, cousins, like people just died all around her. And she was like having to bury all of these people in like one single day. Yeah. And she had to have all of these like royal funerals for like four or five different people, which I can only imagine it's like a nine-year-old. That's gotta be fucking This is Yeah, this would have been like a huge source of trauma in her life that affects her in something we'll talk about down the line. But yeah, going to like... 10 different funerals in a week when you're nine. Oh, that's so yeah, sad. Uh, good thing we have vaccines, guys. Oh my God. <laughs> vaccines are good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, as a result of this, I think Lily was really, like we said, traumatized. And so she ended up diving into books, which uh, as a fellow nerd, I can, totally can relate. relate. <laughs> books are my friends. So, I mean, also it's like a common thing, you know, regardless regardless of your age, even as a child to like dissociate in some way and try to like fill your mind with something else instead of all the death that just happened. So whenever she was younger, she recalls being uh, at home and there was a school next to her home and like all these little school boys would like climb the wall and like climb over the wall to like try to get a look at this, you know, because she's a princess. Oh my gosh. Oh, so you can see that. So This is how she recalls meeting the future man that she would marry. (laughs) He was a, he was a creep. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Ethan Tom. His name was John O. Dominus. And uh, she described him in her autobiography as a cute little urchin. (laughs) She was like, that's, that's kind of adorable, I I guess. guess. Uh, But we're going to like put a pin in this because there's no child marriages in this story. Oh, thank God. <laughs> they waited until they were adults to get married. Yes. This is just like the first time that they laid eyes Ooh. on each other. Around this time, the Royal Boarding School that she was going to shut down. And, you know, I guess starving children just didn't seem to be keeping the doors open. Not a good <laughs> educational tool. Go figure. No. Nah. <laughs> so Lily goes back home to live with her adoptive parents. She, you know, she would later recall she didn't view her birth parents' house as her home. This was her home. This mm-hmm. was where she grew up. But I mean, so Lily would have been 12 at this time. She had been going to that boarding yeah. school since she was four. So, <sighs> you know, she doesn't seem to talk about it a lot in her autobiography or anything, but that must have been a shift you know like going yeah going from this like abusive school to like going to a home that people actually feed you right so um (laughs) this is like a time for the next few years this is a time where lily is very happy thank god Mm -hmm. (laughs) right so soon after her move home um her adopted sister ends up marrying 
for love, which <gasps> clutch her How pearls. How dare she? Yeah, yeah, but obviously as a royal, you're not supposed to do that back in the day. It really pissed off her. Because I think they eloped, right? Yeah. yeah, they did. Like, they were like, we don't want you to marry him. And she's like, but I'm gonna. And they're like, don't do it. But I'm gonna. <laughs> but they ended up like reconciling. So I guess that's at least I mean, they worked What's the it point out, in staying you know? mad at your kid? What's done is done. You know, just. Yeah. <laughs> so now that adopted sister is married off, it's time to put Lily on the bachelorette mark. You're next. <laughs> so her first suitor was Gorham Gillum. That and is he Gorham actually- Gillum. Gorham G squared. I like that. <laughs> Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> Gigi. <laughs> so Gigi was a house guest and he was staying with them. So it was, I guess he was just like, hey, I'm yo, here. I'm just a friend. I'm a friend of the family and we kind of like each other, but it didn't work out. And unfortunately, her uh, adopted parents ended up dying like right after yeah. this. So they never saw her marry. Yeah. She was briefly engaged to her cousin named William Lunalilo. He goes on to be king for a short time. I didn't really get a chance to dive into him, but like it, something must have been off with this guy because everybody in the royal family hated him. He proposed to Lily like three times. She finally accepted. They had a common interest in music. They also had a common family tree. Like I said, they were cousins. <laughs> but then the current king, like called up Lily and was like, you have to break up that engagement. I hate that guy. And so Lily, of course, was like, okay. Okay. He really didn't seem that invested in it. It's like, why is the king so like- Well, Luna Lilo had tried to marry, was like deeply, deeply in love with the current king's um, sister, I think. And he really wanted to marry her. And they were like, no, you're not suitable. So I don't, but I don't know why. I couldn't figure out why everybody hated this guy so much. He's just like the, I he's know, just like the was... black, the black sheep of the family. So, but yeah, when the king calls you and tells you break off your engagement, you go, okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so not long after the engagement was broke off, she, you know, got involved with that curious little mm-hmm. urchin that she had met mm-hmm. in her childhood. John was an American whose uh, family had moved to Hawaii when he was mm-hmm. five. So he was practically born and raised in Hawaii. Right. His dad was a sea captain and he ended up in Hawaii and did really well for himself with all of the trade and all of yeah. the money. And as a result, his son went to that school and made friends with the royal family eventually Mm -hmm. like we mentioned john and lily knew each other as kids right and as an adult john got a job working for the hawaiian crown prince we're gonna call him prince lot which i thought that was an interesting you don't hear like you hear biblical names a lot Ah! (laughs) lot is not a biblical name because that wasn't he the one whose like wife turned to salt a pillar of salt or something yeah I think you're right, but yeah, he it's, was, it's just it's yeah. just not a biblical name you hear often. And so when I saw that, I was just like, why? Why that one? He like, oh, he dwelt in a cave with his two daughters. <laughs> so maybe that's why, because that's a little creepy. Is not the one who had <laughs> sex with his daughters? The Bible's weird. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but well <laughs> anyway, let, let's move on. For this becomes a whole different kind of episode. But um, no, so John worked for Prince Lot and the current king. He would like, I don't know, he was kind of like just one of their dudes that hung around, like a la- whatever the equivalent of a lady in waiting kind of is, a dude in waiting. Um, when the royal family would go on these big outings, John would come along, you know, to make sure to help them get situated and just kind of anything anybody might need, which was a really cush job to have. It was a really prestigious job. Um, So good for Mm -hmm. him. And on one of these outings, he bumps into Lily and I was like, oh, remember me? I used to peep on you. And she was like, I remember you. You used to peep on me. (laughs) There was chemistry. The spark started flying. Weird. Oh, baby, there were five Weird thing to connect over, but whatever. (laughs) Yeah, right. Oh, remember whenever I uh, committed a felony (laughs) and peeped at you? Isn't that charming? (laughs) On one of those excursions, he asked if he could walk Lily home. So we all know back in the day, that's like, 
And she's like, mm, yeah, mm, okay. <laughs> but this clumsy ass motherfucker. <laughs> he ends up falling off of his horse and broke his fucking leg. This sounds like something I would do. <laughs> it's like, I really like this person. Let me walk you home. And then the first thing that happens is I break my fucking leg. Bless <laughs> his little heart. <laughs> And the entire time he's like, nope, nope, I'm going to escort you home. Nope, nope we're going to make it home. This is happening. So, uh, so uh, that's sweet, I guess. Yeah, like, I guess. Uh, <laughs> like, at least he was committed at the right. time. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so the king that we mentioned earlier, let's talk briefly about him. Um, his name is Kamahamea. and the fourth. Uh, the fourth. So I just wanted to throw in a little story about him. Um, so we're just going to call him King K4 because uh, it's really hard to say his fucking mm-hmm. full name. Uh, and Lily, so Lily goes out and she goes on a tour of, you know, the volcanoes in Hawaii. And the king all of a sudden thinks that his wife is like sleeping with his secretary. And so he goes crazy and like shoots him in the chest. The secretary? Oh yes. my God. So the king like, just like, you're sleeping with my wife. Bam, shoots him in the chest. And everyone's like- "How?" Old? So Lily witnessed that? She didn't witness it, but it was like, she was on tour okay. like, and she was like, seeing all the volcanoes and all of a sudden they're like, the king just shot his secretary. And they're like, what the fuck? And they're obviously like, uh, we're not gonna charge him with a crime. Cause he's cause- the king king Ooh. long story short like this king like he thought he was gonna he he almost abdicated the throne because of it wow. but they convinced him not wow. to yeah but also um the king's four-year-old son at this time went into a fit and so his dad put him in cold water apparently the kid caught like a brain fever and died oh. at four so he accidentally pretty much killed his own kid yeah so like is he like crazy? also what 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 is that punishment? Like, stop acting up. I'm going to dunk you in water. Like, what? Cold water. What? Like that. I, I, that's a new one for me. Do we know yeah. if he was mentally unwell or maybe had syphilis? <laughs> syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So back to the story. Sorry. I just had to get throw that one out of there because I was like, what? Yeah. Fuck, she wrote that in her autobiography and was like, what the fuck? Yeah, he doesn't sound stable. So Lily and John were engaged from 1860 to 1862 and were finally married on September 16th at 1862. Nice. Some research that I found like said that they had a really unhappy mm-hmm. marriage because John had like this little wandering penis that just found vagina. That sounds like it like detaches <laughs> and just like walks on its balls out of the house. Do, do, yeah. Do, 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 do. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that. In uh, Lily's autobiography, she, she doesn't mention this, obviously, because I feel like that would be kind of painful for her yeah. to be like, this is my autobiography and my husband cheated on me. Right. Uh, but she did she did say in that autobiography that she very much valued his opinion, like his political opinion on what was going on. I feel like after they got married, she realized that he had no intentions of keeping it in his pants. She felt like she had made a mistake, but they could and divorce wasn't really a thing that was going to happen because they lived apart pretty much most of their marriage but I think that they still really respected each other. So it was more of a business relationship than anything else. For sure. Like it's a, like a, a, a the queen's advisor or yeah. the princess's advisor is like a, there was an advisor role and it wasn't really like a love match. They initially started off you know, in love and marrying for love, but it didn't, didn't work out. Yeah. But I do think that they loved each other in a way and respected each other it just wasn't it just wasn't a romantic match in the in the end yeah because they didn't have they any didn't have kids, it, yeah oh, i mean i ju- it just leads me to believe that they like didn't sleep together like ever <laughs> yeah. yeah so shortly after their marriage lily got bit by the philanthropy bug um she got a brilliant idea to wash cars in her bikini and raise Nathan. money to make a hospital Nathan. Oh. Was she was she so, really yeah. in a bikini? Uh, yeah, there's no bikinis or cars. <laughs> um, <laughs> she just helped to fundraise the Queen's Hospital, which basically means that she just went around and she asked each business for yeah. money. Hey, give us money. We're building the hospital. So she was 
H E R E here for that education in healthcare. Yes. Honey. And I love that because she's grown up in the public eye and the people of Hawaii love and respect her just for being who she is. So she's such a good person to do that fundraising because people already know mm-hmm. who she is and they know that whatever she's putting her name behind is going to be a good thing for the country. Exactly. And so she also helped to found the Ka'ahumanu Society. Nailed Nailed it. it. (laughs) And so what that was, it was an all woman organization to help the elderly in the ill. So that's still, that's still going today. That's still an active society to... So is the hospital. The hospital is also still like a lot of these, I think almost everything that she put in force is still, still going. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. (laughs) So let's Mm -hmm. talk about her obsession with music real quick. Mm, Yeah. Like throughout her childhood, she was always really good at music. And I'm not saying like regular music, like I can, I can read music. I can play the piano. But this bitch could write music. That is like a whole different ball. I can listen to music real good. I cannot (laughs) do any of those other things you mentioned. (laughs) But no, yeah, she could like literally that just like somebody give her like a piano in an hour. And then they'd they'd be like, write a song. And then they'd come back and she'd be like, yeah, I knocked it out in like 15 minutes. What what else you want? You know? (laughs) Yeah, she did end up writing like the national anthem for Hawaii in 1866. And she like wrote it in a week. Like she literally wrote the national anthem for Hawaii. I mean, it was later changed in 1869 because hashtag all of these Hawaiian nobles really love music. (laughs) Like they all write their own national anthem. She later wrote the famous Hawaiian song Aloha Oi, which when you think of Hawaiian music, that's probably the song that immediately pops in your head. Aloha oi, aloha yeah. oi, na So she would also uh, start to write down Hawaiian hymns and chants that they had been using for centuries. So this is really cool and really important. Each family would have a chant or a song about their ancestors that they passed down. And it was all just done orally. Like they would just sing sing it in in the public square. So Lily actually transposed it and wrote it down so that people could keep these copies of the stories of their ancestors for centuries, which is so cool. That's really important because the more and more that the English and Americans were like coming in and anglicizing everything the more lost the hawaiian traditions got because they weren't written down it reminds me a lot of uh rana valona um uh-huh. you know in madagascar yeah how it was like but less murdery lo- no <laughs> yeah a lot <laughs> less murder like i just mean more about like the traditions being oral and not written down and uh finally Lily comes across and it's like, hey, maybe we should document this shit. Yeah, and that's so cool because it's like people's history. Right? So, okay, we're going to really have to go down this. Like, it's going to be a quick r- little rabbit hole about a bunch of kings that aren't really related to Lily, but it will come back I to promise Lily. it's important to the story. <laughs> yes. So King K4, he ends up dying because he has like chronic asthma. <clears throat> and he had named his brother Prince Lot, you know, because nobody names somebody lot um it's like might as well make you the king of hawaii you got a really fun name <laughs> and he was he became king k the fifth because they're all from the kahamawea tribe or mm-hmm. whatever so they just kind of all adopt that name but we're gonna call him king lot just because to it, keep it, things it, separate yeah <laughs> yeah so her husband had actually worked for king lot's staff so <laughs> your your boss now is the king so guess what you get a promotion Let me upgrade you yeah, and I'm sure it didn't hurt that his wife is like a really powerful princess. You know. Probably helped, <laughs> yeah. So uh, King Lot also did share like Lily's taste in music. And he would later like let her write music for the Royal Hawaiian Band so that she could be a composer and they could play the music. So they had that mutual, like I said, all the Hawaiians just yeah. like fucking love music and I'm here for it. A little about... Prince Lot is he was big in promoting more traditional Hawaiian 
um, traditions and songs and just the culture. And he, he looked around and was just like, okay, all these white people coming in are really trying, like making the Hawaiian people forget about their own culture. So he was really trying to promote the Hawaiian indigenous lifestyle. Hindsight is 2020. He was also (laughs) super anti-alcohol. So he would not like the show, (laughs) but apparently alcoholism was a major issue with the indigenous people. Oh yeah. I think one of the Kings, um, I think it was Lulu, Luna Lilo. I think one of them had like a really bad alcohol problem. Yeah. A lot of the Kings had alcohol problems. Yeah. Well, apparently a lot of Hawaiian, like indigenous Hawaiian people just in general, Mm -hmm um suffered from alcoholism really bad so king lot was really like anti-alcohol and i don't think it was illegal or anything during his reign but he was definitely like don't do it you know just say no kids so king lot gets real fucking sick couldn't find from what but it had to be like something all of a sudden because he didn't name an heir apparent so but newsflash that's not a good Mm -hmm. thing um (laughs) so everyone was like at this point all kind of like immediately all looked at luna lilo like at the same moment and he's like clenches his butt cheeks and it's like oh god i guess it's gonna be me me. (laughs) king lot did not want to pass it on to uh, luna lilo and he goes the throne belongs to luna lilo I will not appoint him because I consider him unworthy for the position. So he was sort of like, I'm not going to say it. I'll let you guys choose him as your next leader after I'm dead, which I, what, what did everybody have against this guy? So the only thing that I can like really think of is that like Luna Lilo is more pro American British, like more pro you know them coming in whereas king k5 or king lot he's like no I, make hawaii great again and he's like luna lilo is not all about it so anyway king lulu um or he's about to be king <laughs> <laughs> he was like not that much of an important king it's kind of sad because i think he was really liked by all the people but he was only king he was king for less than a year so it's yeah and guess what he died with no heir apparent. <laughs> with no successor. Who are these people? Like, maybe did he? I, I don't know. Maybe he died quite suddenly as well. But he had the rumor was that he had planned to name the Dowager Queen King K4's wife, Queen Emma. He had meant to name her as his heir, which was an interesting choice. Yeah, interesting, Lulu. Very interesting. Because she's a white woman. And mm-hmm. she's she's half white, half white. Oh, is she? I thought she was I thought she was totally white. Yeah, she's, she's got some Hawaiian in her. Okay. But she's half white. Yeah. So that was a problem. Mm-hmm. That was a big problem because she was half uh white. They're like, uh no, uh no. But according to to the Hawaiian constitution at the time, since there was no heir apparent, you had to be picked by the legislator. So at this point, it is a battle because uh, Lily's brother, who also has a very powerful claim to the throne named David, ends up throwing his hat into the ring to be the king as well as Queen Emma. So now Lily's brother might be king. So see, we told you all that other backstory was going to be important. (laughs) Lots of dead dudes finally brings it back to Lily. So yeah, so now in one corner, we got Dowager Queen Emma. And in the other corner, we got Lily's brother, David, who's going to be the next monarch. Let's say that shit was tense, bitch. (laughs) So there was like constant fighting between who would reign, which is such a departure from like English Mm -hmm. culture because it literally, they just choose the next closest relation, period. Yeah, Like there's not really much uh battle there there is a little but it's not like this where you have to elect a king yeah you know so lily's brother ended up winning by a landslide in the legislator because what i was reading is that lily's brother david he was very popular amongst the rich white settlers Mm -hmm. and a lot of the rich white settlers were in the legislator because guess what money and land Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
makes you a politician, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Um, Queen Emma's supporters were all of the people of Hawaii, like the normal people. Yeah. So what what do you think happens whenever the rich, powerful people choose a leader that the regular people don't want? Um, I, I, I'm guessing it's not good. It's a riot. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. So there was there were a bunch of riots. And uh, at that point, I think they had to have some like of the uh, armed forces come in to arrest people. But at that point, Queen Emma kind of like Dowager Queen Emma, she kind of you know, exit stage right and remains the saltiest bitch ever. But didn't they have to call in like martial law or something? Yeah, it got cool, 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 oh cool, my cool, gosh. Cool. But luckily <clears throat> for our girl Lily, luckily for our girl Lily, uh, the new king is her brother. So he goes by the name Kalakuea. So, but we're gonna call him David. Yes, because that's way easier. Yeah. <laughs> so. Obviously, whenever your brother becomes king, he's going to start appointing you to a higher position, your brother or sister to a higher position, your husband. Um, And David doesn't have any kids. So at this point, he appoints his brother as heir apparent, which is like, thankfully, he knows what to do and appoints an heir apparent right right off the bat. (laughs) But his brother ended up dying. So it didn't quite work out. Uh, yes everybody everybody it was very easy to die back then i guess yeah so the next choice that would you know be the in terms of like uh the english hereditary thing would be his adopted parents because apparently they came from a very powerful family that also had a claim to the throne but lily's brother was like i really don't want any other family ruling because he would be the first person of his family to rule. Mm-hmm. So he wants to appoint someone from his family to keep it going. In his bloodline. Mm-hmm. And so then he looks at Lily. Yay! So she actually gets named heir apparent. This is obviously women, even throughout Hawaiian history, women could hold positions of power. So it wasn't uncommon for them to do that. So at this point, they renamed her to the name that we know of her today, which is Lilio Kalani. So yes. she's not quite named after Pink Eye anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the new king hits the road for a world tour. Like so Cher. Yes. <laughs> so King Cher, hits, <laughs> he's going to go off for a whole year and rub elbows with world leaders all over the world. I and, feel like that's normal. Like whenever you're like, yeah. oh, I'm the king now. I got to go make sure everybody knows who the king of Hawaii is. Exactly. So he leaves Lily as regent for a whole fucking year, which is huge for her. That mm-hmm. is a lot of responsibility. And so now she is in the limelight. She is like front and center for the whole country looking at her. I think she does a fantastic job. She doesn't know that she's about to be hit with a fucking pandemic. Yeah, so soon after Cher left on her world tour, um, a ship with these Chinese laborers hits the scene in Hawaii. And on that ship were several men infected with smallpox. So I remember 30 years ago when like her entire family and all her friends died. Mm-hmm. That pandemic had knocked out 10% of the Hawaiian population. That mm-hmm. That's huge. So when it was realized that smallpox was on the island, it was a panic. Lily had to step up and show leadership. She didn't have a choice, you know? Like, did she not only show up, she rose to the fucking occasion and assumed all the responsibility like a boss, bitch. Who won the world? Girls. Lily. Lily. (laughs) She shut down the borders. She started to quarantine the entire island. You know, the islands of Hawaii are several different islands. She was like, no, we're just like not having none of the other islands are like having physical contact. Like we are just shutting everything off. People cannot come into the islands. People can't leave the islands. Yeah. And it really, for her, that was really a great decision because it made the disease easy to contain and you could send people off to a certain island who were infected so that you couldn't get anybody else infected. And, uh, but even still, (laughs) Lily did a step further and did something even better. She put in like a lots of uh, quarantine orders and she like completely shuts down borders. I read one thing that like she would 
Like if she caught like one family kept breaking like curfew, curfew and quarantine, she would literally go put a guard outside their house. So like when they would go to leave, the guard would be like, nope, you're turning back around. You're going back inside. And this wasn't popular because like tourism, just like now is a, was a huge industry in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So not letting people come in was hitting like a real, like making the islands have a real financial burden. But she was just like, oh, I'm sorry. Do y'all want to like take a little hit financially or do you want to die? Um, so and like, <laughs> that's and, such a hard decision. Yeah, I know it. Well, <clears throat> it's it just remind me so much of like modern times because there were a lot of businesses like pushing back on her really hard being like my hotel is not going to survive this. And she's mm-hmm. like, well, would you rather your hotel not survive this or you not survive this? Yeah. And I think that Hawaii actually in this pandemic did well as well because they were able to shut off their borders and shut off yeah. all, every, all thing. But either way, in, in the end of it all, just under 300 people and died. So that's, I mean, we don't want any life to end because of it. Yeah. But, you know, there were 700 people affected, 300 people died. That's really not bad because compared to the last outbreak, yeah, she exactly. it was like 10% of the population died. <laughs> I think she did a phenomenal job with this pandemic. And I think it's so interesting to think about too, is that, you know, she's not the leader of this country, but she can't send a letter to her brother and ask him what he wants her to do because she's quarantined the island. And it's not like she can email him. So he doesn't even know this is happening. She's doing it all on her own and she's just really stepping up for her people. And I just applaud her for how she handled this. Mm -hmm. So a quick history of sickness in Hawaii. So ever since Europeans and Americans started coming to Hawaii, the native people started getting sick because like I was saying earlier, very much like the Brits coming over, Europeans coming over to America and infecting the Indians, they just don't have the immune system for the diseases. You know, every time there was an outbreak of a disease like smallpox, the natives were hit so much harder because the Americans and Europeans were probably already immune to it. Right. So Lily is not fucking around with any sort of pandemic because she understands the concept of science. (laughs) (laughs) But after this, like she just really, she, she developed a lifelong passion for uh, healthcare. Like we've already touched on a little bit after this, she is just like, it is my responsibility as someone born into privilege to help those that are poor and make sure they have basic rights like uh, access to health care, regardless of their income level. Oh my God, gee, wonder why that would yeah. be important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so later in that same year, she ended up uh, visiting a leper settlement in Hawaii. And this was one of those other moments that she kind of noted in her autobiography that really kind of, you know, left a, a wound, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you've ever seen leprosy, it ain't pretty. Like it's, I, I have not seen it and I have not looked at pictures because I've heard enough descriptions to know yeah. I don't want to see that. It sounds, oh my God, I would be affected too. Yeah, so she was so sad that about what, you know, the people's condition that she couldn't even talk to the crowd. Yeah. So she ended up ordering one of her brother's ministers to perform the speech for her because she was just so teared up, which I thought was really cool that she's, she's yeah. got emotion. She cares about her people. And know? she's, she's, um, open enough to show that vulnerability too. Yeah. And yeah. so the brother's minister ends up doing the speech for her and later on, she's like, okay, you're a night commander now. You just got a promotion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Lily would best be described as a philanthropist, as a humanitarian for her own people for the rest of her life. And even till today, she was constantly trying to find ways to better the lives of Hawaiians and especially women. So this is what I really loved about her. She founded a bank for women on the main island of Hawaii. So it was a woman that could, you know, go and deposit her own money in a bank instead of it being in her husband's name. And she also like found a money lending institution for women so that they could help you know, fund their kids' education or help. That is, that is so ahead of its time too, because like Mm -hmm. 
in the UK and in America and stuff, like a woman couldn't even get a credit card without a man signing off on it until like the fucking 1970s. Yeah, so that's huge. <laughs> so that's uh, that's so ahead of its time. That's so awesome. Yeah, and then she also started the Lilio Okolani Educational Society, which was basically like a charm school for girls. Um, <laughs> she she gave a lot to the women in Hawaii and did a lot to them, and it's like this is also during the suffragette movement this is the same time as victoria woodhull mm-hmm. so lily is making a national stand and it's a very progressive one for that time yeah and by the way she did all of this in one year this is all in the same year <laughs> <laughs> that her brother was gone like what the fuck like she's amazing so then her brother comes back and he learns about everything that went down and all of the shit that she accomplished and she, he's just like, wow, you are a huge asset to Hawaii. I'm going to use you to progress our people as much as I can. And she's like, cool. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. She's like, I'm on board with that. Sounds good. Yeah. So in 1887, Lily got an Evite. And it was <laughs> it was from our girl, Queen Victoria, a.k.a. Queen V. Queen and v. she's like, let's go to the Golden Jubilee. So... For those that don't know, that's like Victoria's 50th year throne celebration. Basically like, yay, you've been on the throne for a really fucking long time. Half a century, soldiers. <laughs> so, the king wasn't able to go. So he ended up setting up a crew to go and like represent him. And so in that crew was his wife, Lily, Lily's husband, who <laughs> oh, wish she would just drop off the face of the earth. I kind of forgot he existed because he wasn't no. really a part of all the big stuff going down that year. Mm -mm. and then a few other people um lily obviously when she gets to eva she's like can i go can i go go? (laughs) yeah and then whenever she goes uh before she leaves i thought this was really cool she uh went to her little educational society that not little uh but she you know there are five kids at the educational society that she really like bonded with she kissed each one of them goodbye and had tears in her eyes while she said goodbye by to them so i think that she liked education because she might have saw those as her own kids uh, yeah because she didn't have any and right. then she did she at that point departs in england and uh first stop is she California. Depart, she departs in england for england for <laughs> in- <laughs> oh <my> wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so first stop is uh california because she's going going california knows how to party, party. I like that one. So when she like lands in California, I love her descriptions in her autobiography because she's like describing the landscapes. It's like, I'm imagining like this five-year-old kid that has these wide eyes and it's just like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Because she sees all of these mountains and they have like snow on them. (laughs) <laughs> like the, right? the, the Hawaiian islands do have mountains that have snow on them but it's like really high up that there's snow here there's like snow all over yeah so they stopped and they had a snowball fight and she Aww. had the time of her life and she even wrote in her autobiography she was like everybody in Hawaii would love this <laughs> I hate snow uh, yeah Katie hates the cold I hate, but I thought it was really snow. cool that but it's cool like, for, I her. Just see her, for her I see her as like this really happy kindergarten kid yeah. like, oh my God. was this her this was probably her first time to leave the island right yes so she'd never right. been out of a, out of the country for her because it's At this time, Hawaii is a different country. Um, So they made their way across the United States, eventually got to D.C. Then after D.C., she met, uh, or at D.C., she met the current president and the first lady. So that would be uh, Grover Cleveland and Francis Cleveland. And uh, they were, they were pretty pro-Hawaii. Like they liked Hawaii. (laughs) When Lily arrived in London, it was a fucking festival. I mean, this was like a big fucking deal. Anyone who was anyone in any noble family in the world was invited. And because I think I'm pretty sure that this was like the longest reigning monarch in in England ever. And yeah, in history, she's getting to meet all these people, all these princes and princesses. And she's getting to see people like just dressed to the nines. And And, but it's all like cultural dress too, because each nobility kind of dresses a little bit differently. So Mm -hmm. she was just like bewildered by all of the different crowns and flowers and styles and all of that. 
And just seeing all this culture that she would have never seen before. And she loved it. She fucking loved it. Yeah, and then Queen Queen V herself ends up meeting Lily. And they sit there and they chit-chat about her, her brother and the king. And, you know, they had already met. And they kind of, like, talked about how they met. Nothing real, real deep. But shortly after she met Queen V, uh, Lily got an email. And it was like, hey, your brother uh, was forced to sign like this constitution and he's no longer in power now. Um, <laughs> you, you might have a problem when you come home. <laughs> BT dubs, not to put a damper in your vacay. But, <laughs> um... And this constitution uh, that he, he had signed giving away his power was called the bayonet constitution which doesn't doesn't put a nice image in your head (laughs) because guess what they forced him to sign it with a bayonet pointed at him (laughs) so he had no choice uh, yeah what we're getting at it literally took all the power away from the monarchy and gave it to the rich white guy legislator what a surprise (laughs) what a surprise so now the monarchy is just like a figurehead and really has no power so immediately once she gets this email all of her advisors are like lily you're gonna have to go back and claim power g to g gotta go (laughs) and they're in her book she she says that she refused but there are other people that are like she said that oh, I'll do it only if it's necessary. She's right. like, only if I have to. They cut that trip short and yes. they go back home to Hawaii, which I, it didn't take that long. I remember reading like how long it took and I was like, really? It only took like nine days or something? Oh, wow. I thought it would take way longer than that. I but they were like- they were on a boat and it was in the express lane, bitch. They were <laughs> back the fuck home because guess what? When they roll up to Hawaii, there's a bunch of people standing there and guess what they are? A bunch of rich white guys. David is pissed and honestly scared, which he, did, he had a gun pointed at him. Check same, David. <laughs> David. And he's like, I have to get out of here. I feel like my life is being threatened. I am super fucking stressed out. Um, you know, he actually being, gets physically ill too. Like it's I mean, so bad. He gets I imagine, Ill. yeah, I imagine the stress of having to abdicate with a bayonet pointed at you might do that. Yep. And so where and he ends up going to California. Why, Katie? Because California, California knows, knows how, how to party. party. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I mean, if you're from Hawaii, which is famously sunny you would think it would be beautiful here if i leave <laughs> but you know when there's people there that want to kill you eh. yeah but there was actually rumors that at this point the king was trying to go to dc to secretly negotiate a treaty to be like hey hands off hawaii it's mine you know right and so lily at this point is like maybe you should stay here to like you know don't start no shit so there won't be no shit right and he's like nope gotta go gotta go Gotta, so gotta after go to he, Cali. Yeah, and after he landed in California, um, he suffered a stroke in Santa Barbara and then ended up dying shortly after on January 20th, 1891. So guess what? You should have listened to Lily. <laughs> he was only 54. I know. A lot of these kings that died before were super young, like 30s and 40s. Right. So, But Lily didn't end up finding out about her brother's death until like nine days later when the king's Ugh. boat arrived so the king's boat is coming back and the flag is at half mast. can you imagine seeing that like coming up the shore and your heart just like sinking oh that's what she like like, in her autobiography she was like and i knew it was awful like her heart hit the floor i know i hate that for her i hate that feeling so his remains were returned to honolulu and at that point that same exact day lily was sworn in as queen because thankfully they appointed her an heir apparent yes (laughs) so she is officially the queen of hawaii she is the first female reigning monarch and she's 51 years old i don't we had um a listener recently request that we like tell us how old queens are but like uh, big epic and i was like oh i never thought about that so just mm-hmm. in case you were wondering she is 50 51 years old when she becomes queen uh the first act uh as being queen is she forced all of her brother's cabinet to resign 
Well, I mean, I know this Whitey McWhiterson cabinet was probably pissed off, but guess what? You're the ones that kind of helped this whole bayonet constitution go down. Right? So, what did they expect? Get the fuck out. <laughs> they involved the Supreme Court of Hawaii, and all but all but one judge sided with Lily. I mean, again, we've kind of already discussed she's so popular in Hawaii. So she's been in public for her whole life. She saved everyone's asses in a pandemic. Yeah. She's she's investing in education and healthcare. Popular. Um so popular. <laughs> obviously other than getting a new cabinet, she has a, a litany of other things to do. Time to do what her brother did and elevate all of the friends and family if they weren't elevated already. Right. Uh, namely her husband was named Prince Consort, and she named her niece heir apparent. Thank God. She's smart. Yes. <laughs> um, you got to name those heirs to avoid fucking riots. And she appointed like, like all of her BFFs to the cabinet. And, you know, these were people that she knew would back her up and knew that would write a new constitution that said, okay, the monarchy's back in house, bitch. Speaking of, it's time to get our girl back in power. They proposed a constitution that would give power completely back to Lily. It wasn't just Lily who wanted power. The two major political parties and two thirds of the the voters wanted her to have that power as well. So it's not like she was just being some like power crazy monarch, like the people wanted her. It's just the the legislators, a bunch of rich white guys that are against her. And um, despite this, there's a lot of backlash. The country is just split at this time. There's the royalist who want Lily. And then there's the missionary party who want um, the the white legislators to like take back over. So during Lily's reign, there was a great deal of inner fighting in the uh, population. Lily wanted to be pro Hawaiian and to preserve that culture, because honestly, even today, Hawaiians are still fighting to keep their culture because it's been so watered down by Chinese and American. And, you know, there's a lot Mm. of watering down of their culture. Absolutely. But a lot of natives had made a lot of money off of the white folks coming to Hawaii and they wanted to keep making more money. And clearly Americans aren't like super worried about preserving culture. Mm -mm. They just want more money. So each side creates their own council to protect themselves. And the missionaries had the committee of safety and the royalists had the committee of law and order. And the leaders of the royalist committee went to arrest the missionary positioners. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 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 uh. (laughs) Yeah, it's talking about sex. (laughs) And they wanted to put Hawaii under martial law. Mm -hmm. And Lily actually wasn't cool with this. And she really didn't even know the whole scope of it. She didn't realize how much over the top her supporters were being and how kind of like dangerous they were being, you know? Yeah, and the missionary guys are... Whitey McWhiterson. So obviously they're buddies with probably some of the U.S. ministers in Hawaii and some of the really big like armed forces people. So guess who strolls on up? The Marines and some sailors all start showing up to Hawaii. Luckily, I mean, there was no bloodshed because of all this. Just, I mean, because think about it. If you're a native Hawaiian having these men show up in boats with guns, that's going to scare the fuck out of you. Yes, of course it is. So sadly, Queen Lily was deposed on January 17th, 1893. And the uh, anti-monarchy leaders were then put in control of Hawaii. And they called it uh, the provisional government, which is what they called it. That was reinstated in Hawaii, where basically the monarch had no power. So on February 1st, Hawaii was declared under the control of the United States. Uh, The Hawaiian flag was lowered over the Hawaiian palace and the U.S. flag was raised. Like what? They're such dick. I know. Like, why does it matter? Uh, (laughs) But but I want my flag. Lily barely got a chance to even rule. You know what I I mean? I know. I hate that. She she did so much good stuff during the Regency that... uh, 
it's just like she was so cut short. She was such mm. a brilliant woman. I but know. she's not gonna go she's not going down without a motherfucking fight though. Of course not. Uh-uh. Of course she, not. She protests that she gets her Karen pants on and she talks to the manager. She talks to the supervisor. <laughs> she talks to the mayor, the governor, and goes all the way up to goddamn President Cleveland. And then thankfully, President Cleveland declares that this like you know sudden annexation of hawaii might be a little bit illegal yeah (laughs) so he tells lily like we're gonna give back hawaii but you need to pardon everybody in the government that was part of this seizure and she told him that like per their constitution she doesn't have the power to pardon them and that actually their actions could be punishable by death yeah and this was like i know that she was trying to be factual about this and say look i i can't i can't pardon this but there what she should have said was okay yeah (laughs) because the guy that uh was corresponding between her and uh, president cleveland left out the part that she basically was like i really can't do this he left that part out he basically just said she's gonna kill him (laughs) she's gonna kill him if she's given power back and so of course the president is just like well that i can't i'm sorry if we're gonna kill them all and it's just it was this huge misunderstanding and it's so it's so unfortunate because she wasn't saying that she was gonna have all these people executed she was just saying well this is our law i'll see what i can do yeah, I mean, he basically wanted to have her barred from any influence mm. whatsoever. So this freaked Lily the fuck out. Like, she didn't really mean that she was going to kill these people. What she said was just misinterpreted. So she ended up telling the president that she's willing to grant them amnesty, but unfortunately it was too late for the legislator. They had already denied her request and formed the Republic of Hawaii on... <sighs> July 4th, 1893. Of course they did. Ugh, assholes. <laughs> Once again, the Hawaiians staged a rebellion. Again. <laughs> and they rioted. Again. again. They don't want this American government, but this time it was different and the coup failed and all the participants were arrested. Yeah, and they ended up like searching Lily's palace and they found all these guns because they're like, oh my God, she planned this whole thing. So they arrested her. But in her memoir, she said, she was like, no, those were just like my my husband's old guns that were in like the back house that he had like a collection of. And so this is how they were able to arrest her and Mm -hmm. imprison her. So she was sentenced to five years in prison and lots of her supporters were also in prison and many of them were given the death penalty, like a little drastic. Yeah, Uh uh-huh. Lily was presented with an ultimatum. She could admit defeat and officially abdicate the throne. If she did this, she would be let out of jail. But more importantly, her supporters, their death penalty sentences would either be converted or they'd be completely pardoned. And given that choice, she made the rough decision to officially denounce her rights to rule the Hawaiian people. She later said... um, if it was just about me, I would have chosen death, but like, I can't, I can't have these people's blood on my hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, She wrote, think of my position, sick, a lone woman in prison, scarcely knowing who was my friend or who listened to my words only to betray me without legal advice or friendly counsel and the stream of blood steady to flow unless it stayed by my pen. Under pressure. Yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot to be weighing on like just one person's. I remember she even said in her memoir, memoir, she could hear soldiers pacing back and forth in front of her um, prison door. So she just constantly heard footsteps. Like she felt like she was just being like, oh, that would make me so crazy. So was she, was she held in like a, prison cell like she was held yeah yeah, she was held in like a room you know it's like a lot of times we talk about these queens that are like imprisoned like eleanor of aquitaine or it was like a i think it was like a house like it was a nice house but she was only allowed like a room 
You know, okay. she wasn't allowed to move around like all of our other queens would have been. She yeah. was like guarded heavily. So um, <clears throat> on October 13th, 1896, thankfully, Lily was pardoned and restored some of her civil rights to her after about a year in prison. So she didn't spend the whole five years, thank God. Thank God. Uh, so obviously when you're, you know, pardoned, the first order of business is get the fuck out of Hawaii. <laughs> I do not blame her. Yeah, and she ends up going to Massachusetts, which is a nice choice. It was here that she compiled all of her songs, wrote her memoir, kind of like put everything down on paper. So (laughs) there was this funny story that I just have to throw in. Uh, While she was in Massachusetts, she was introduced to sleigh riding. And she was like, (laughs) all these people are like, having this good old time sleigh riding everywhere. And she's like, this is like really dangerous. It's really fucking cold. There's no fucking point. Um, how is this fun? Girl, same. <laughs> I don't understand it either. I guess it's mm. one of those sports that the only reason you like it is because you are really good at it. <laughs> grew up doing it or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So after this, Lily traveled from Massachusetts to D.C. At this time, she's obviously advocating for Hawaii to remain independent. Mm -hmm. But surprise, surprise, the United States is a bunch of greedy ass white people. Yes. And they want to annex Hawaii. And President McKinley is not at all like President Cleveland. Um, He blatantly wants Hawaii annexed. Whereas President Cleveland was like, eh, you can keep Hawaii. Yeah. President McKinley was like, ah, ah, we want it. And <clears throat> this attempt was completely circumvented when an overwhelming number of Hawaiians all signed a petition being like, hey, white people, <laughs> <laughs> we kind of like being independent. Could you fuck the fuck off? Right. And then the Senate at that point did uh, vote against annexing Hawaii. But guess what? That didn't last long. No, that doesn't stop Shady Lady USA. Um, <laughs> Shady Lady USA. <laughs> I love it. We just created a new song. Yeah. <laughs> so only like a year later, in July 1898, the United States annexed Hawaii. And that was at the beginning of the Spanish-American War. So it's most likely that they needed more money, more troops, more taxes for this war. And so that's when they were just like, fuck it. (laughs) Grab Hawaii. Hawaii is mine. Uh, mine. So the next month, the official ceremony was performed and the Hawaiian flags were all lowered for the last time. And they rose the American flag over every royal building. So. Lily and anyone who sympathized with her boycotted the event altogether, which can you blame her? Yeah, not at all. Not at all. Lily spent the next decade fighting this decision to take the crown lands in Hawaii. In 1900, she finally moved back to Hawaii to carry on the fight. But unfortunately, that same year, she was diagnosed with cancer. Mm hmm. Um, This didn't stop her, though. She continued to, like, fight for her lands. She even brought it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled against her. Of course, I mean, I'm not surprised, but still, like, it, she was like, I can't just sit here and do nothing. Yeah, and at this point, her health is going really downhill fast. Mm -hmm. And in 1911, she was given a pension. Finally. So at least there's, you know, some money to pay for health care. Well, her pension was about $1,200 a month. And when you account for inflation, it's it ends up being about $400,000 a year, which is what our presidents make right now when they're in office. So at least she was like given like something to live off of, you know? Yeah. Her, her mental capabilities had also deteriorated and it was so bad that she like couldn't remember the house that she had spent her whole life in. So that's like super sad. That is super sad. And she spent the next six years in her childhood home until her health got so bad that everybody was pretty much like, okay, it's about, it's almost time. And right. so they all ended up, it was like her inner circle of, you know, supporters, friends, caregivers. They all surrounded her every day for two months. That's so awesome of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, she had so many people that loved her. 
Mm -hmm. And on November 1917, Queen Lily died in her bed and the bells of all the local churches told 79 times for the 79 years that she was blessed on this earth. Oh, her. Let's talk about her legacy real quick. History has looked back on her very positively. Oh, yeah. She is incredibly popular, both in American and Hawaiian culture. Um, She, the same newspapers that had like previously written about like in favor of her being overthrown were now in her death writing about like this great influence that she was on the Hawaiian people and everyone in Hawaii mourned her passing. Um, when her health began to decline, she had like set up this trust for orphanages to ensure that after her death, like the bulk of her remaining money went to fund these orphanages and everything. And a lot of these organizations are still in practice now. Um, she's just done so many good things. Yeah, and, and she she gave the name to the drink that we're having today, the Aloha yes. Away, which is the song that she wrote. So which yeah, is still the most like when you think Hawaii, you think Aloha Hawaii. So to Queen Lily, you didn't roll long, but you made a huge impact in the time you had, and your life and influence still continue to this day. So let's raise a glass to Queen Lily. Cheers, Lily. Cheers, Lily. Clink. (laughs) So thanks for listening. If there's something you want to hear, just like hit us up. You can email us at queenshistorypodcast at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter. We're at queens underscore podcast. We're on SoundCloud and Stitcher. And follow us on iTunes at queens podcast. All one word. All smushed up. Queens podcast. Um, follow us on Facebook. Our intro music is by K Sparks featuring Beyond Belief. Thanks for letting us use your song, guys. Thanks, guys, for listening. Cheers. Bye, girl. Clink, clink. <laughs> Mwah.